Hello again, everyone, and uh, welcome back to Survivor Man Director's Commentary. And uh, I thought I'd venture back into the documentary series Survivor Man Bigfoot once more. So, cheers. This is Survivor Man Bigfoot, The Legend of Clem 2, which took place in northwestern Canada, north of Vancouver. Incredibly beautiful, I mean stunning, just stunning vistas. Uh, it's, it's just a wonderful place to be and to go and uh, pretty mystical. So, shall we? People that have gone up to the lake have heard things, you know, growling or something moving really fast in the bushes, screaming and hollering. One of the guys even got so scared that he took off in the middle of the night and just left us there. When we got down here, old people told the bush, Sasquatch. He told me that um, it's a bug or she said in her language, you know, like a Sasquatch. Once again, if you missed the other director's commentary on Survivor Man Bigfoot, uh, a gentleman by the name of Mike Stanley put this opening together for me. We would we would inject the different scenes from the different shows, but all of the artwork around it, ah, it's just brilliant. A good, if you're if you're a filmmaker, a really great show opening is important. It sets the tone. It tells everybody that you're you're a pro, um, and so you you want to get into these shows in a way that is just. Sexy and powerful. I'm on my way to a place shrouded in mystique as much as beauty. Clem 2 BC on the northwest Pacific coast of Canada. By all accounts, a pristine wilderness paradise. Washington and California get all the press when it comes to Bigfoot. But in Clem 2, no one even questions the possibility. They're just here, and everyone knows it. Oh, yeah, I'm not sure what I have to say about that. Uh, oh, that's right, I was gonna talk about uh, the tone of my voice. I'll tell you, I'll tell you definitely very much a behind the scenes um, story. When I first uh, was filming the Survivor Man episodes, uh, the thing is, when you hear me talking out in the field and in camera, a lot of times, I'm. I'm talking like this, and uh, you know, it's been uh, three days, and I don't have any food, and I'd be talking like that. That was not put on, it's just sort of the, I don't know, it's kind of like just what happens to me. I think it's probably like the Batman phenomenon. I put on my bandana, and then all of a sudden, I start talking like this. Either that, or it's I'm channeling Clint Eastwood. Either way, that was a, a, a way I would speak when I would uh, be filming my Survivor Man. So when I went in to do my narration for Survivor Man. I found that uh, I would sound like I do right now, all oh, chipper and light, and it really kind of didn't fit. Uh, it would be odd. You'd hear my voice sounding like this instead of sounding like this. And I realized that, well, I couldn't get the same sound on, on my voice uh, for narrating Survivor Man uh, unless I did one certain thing, which I did do. And I'm, I remember the sound engineer, Brian Armour, used to laugh. He, used to, he still, to this day, tells it as, as a story. He calls it artistic dedication. I would take a pillow, go into the sound booth, and scream as hard as I could into the pillow. I would scream, scream, scream until I blew my voice out. And then I'd go to do my narration, and it would be kind of rough like this. And it would work. For, so when I did Survivor Man Bigfoot, uh, I thought, you know, what is the tone? And I, and I actually spoke to my audio, my audio engineer. I said, listen, I want this tone to be very subtle, almost like a ghost story. I want, I want it, and here's what I kept saying. I want it to sound like I'm kind of whispering everything in your ear. And so we changed the mic position and the way I spoke. I slowed down. Like in Survivor Man, I might talk a little bit more like this. But for Survivor Man Bigfoot, I started to slow down what I had to say. And that way, it just cre it, it's all about creating this, this ambiance, if you will. Anyway, I think it works. So, there you go. 
There are thousands of streams and rivers just like this one all along the coast of British Columbia. None of that is uh, stock, stock footage, by the way. That's all our footage, my footage, uh, when we were uh, filming this series. Every fall, anything that has salmon on its menu will come here to feed. It's easy pickings. Wolves, eagles, bears of all species, and any large predator. And around here, everyone is convinced that that's Sasquatch. There we go. Look at that. As easy as that. And there he goes. This particular stream is famous for sightings. Yeah, that was just, yeah. I said, well, I got to go catch one. I mean, I know it's going to be easy, so I got to go catch one just to show how easy it is to catch a salmon in a stream like that. That, that was, that what you saw is what happened. And being, it's right on the edge of the town, the Clem too. Clem too, part paradise, part sleepy little town reminiscent of a Stephen King novel a quiet native village on the edge of the ocean. Its freshwater lake is shrouded in mystery as much as it is the morning fog. They say it's the home of Sasquatch. So the encounters here happen on the main streets and in people's backyards. As it is with every North American native group, no one here thinks Sasquatch is a joke. My aunt is sick. Yeah, so <clears throat> this was one of the things I really loved about doing the uh, Survive Man Bigfoot episodes was it finally gave me a chance to interview people. Uh, I wasn't always able to be there for the interviews. and In fact, I think I missed a lot of them. Uh, but I had a um, great, great team with me, uh, Max Atwood uh, and um, uh, guy, uh, another great fellow named Johnny B., uh, filming for me, Ian Oje also filming. Anyway, Max would film these interviews and uh, it was just wonderful to be able to include it in the show because frankly, so much of what I do is all me, 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 you know, and, and I get kind of tired of it. So it's nice to break the energy and go to someone else. Now, in the case of Clem 2, these interviews, I mean, just let's face it, it's just the sound of their voice. You talk about the sound of someone's voice sound of these native elders uh, and their voice and even the younger people they have that you know that well that that indigenous uh, culturally uh, unique timbre to their voice and it's wonderful to listen to she looks back she in this big thing standing in a red red coat and then i heard this this scream and it was right behind the house and not just us our neighbors heard the same thing too he's walking just down the road there right behind our set of lots of people going by we started running we never stopped till we got down to the corner here whatever it was it was pretty big i'd say nine feet ten feet i figured that was a sasquatch little note on that music there uh, uh, the um, oh gosh I'm, I'm, I'm being a real dork here because I can't remember the name of the, the, the drumming group to look at my CD because I actually we, we recorded them uh, doing that performance and actually I ended up using that and incorporating it into a song called Ancient's Call on my Mother Earth album and they were just, just phenomenal to listen to uh, with their traditional drumming and, uh, and singing, but uh, it just lent a whole new air of sort of a whole new mystic quality to the show. Bakwas. Bakwas is the name they give it here. Throughout the native communities of North America, you can find more than a hundred other names for a being whose existence is taken for granted. On record, they'll tell you their stories of encountering them, but off the record, they'll tell you that they are spiritual beings, not apes, as the cryptozoologists claim. In other words, their belief is they are another type of human with special gifts and powers. That's actually really interesting. You know, <laughs> for those of you who, who can't stand that I do the Survive Man Bigfoot stuff, you're, you're probably not watching this right now. Uh, but if you're caught and you're in the middle, look, understand something. Uh, researching 
the phenomenon, is what I call it, the phenomenon known as Sasquatch or Bigfoot, or in this case, Bakwas, is uh, it's a journey itself. It's a great journey. Wonderful. It's a journey that involves your connecting to nature deeper than you've ever connected before. And so being able to learn from the indigenous cultures of North America and their experience with Bakwas, Sasquatch, Bigfoot, uh, and the fact that there's another hundred names for it, by the way, gets you on this plane of going, hey, wait a minute. What do you mean it's not just a big smart ape? And that, this was, uh, you know, my, my whole journey of doing Survivor Man Bigfoot throughout the series was basically, it's like a metamorphosis for me. The whole thing was a, was a journey of discovery. Every single new place I went, I, I would learn something new and it would just keep stopping me in my tracks until by the end of it all I had this one big sort of actually I would call it like a big cauldron of concepts and ideas and and I was kind of mixing it all together till I till I got to where I am today and, and the kind of things that I think about today apparently somebody's got I think that's Sasquatch hang on let's see if it's him now I forgot. If I don't get it within three rings, I don't get it at all because it, it, it turns off on me. I don't know why it does that, but it does. Okay, enough of that. Where were we? This is my journey into the world of Bigfoot, and what I believe is not important. It's what my hosts here believe that matters, and they've given me permission to travel into the territory. Okay, I want to stop it right there. That's vital in all of my Survive Man Bigfoot stuff. What I believe doesn't matter. But the people that I was interviewing and who were allowing me to go into their regions from Texas to Klim to, it's what they believe and think and experience that matters. And that's what I was doing. Think of me more like a journalist. And I was going with a skeptical yet open mind to meet these people and hear their stories. And then also, secondarily, to challenge their stories and say, well, can I go? Do you mind if I stay out there in your backyard or out on that river bend or off on this lake? see what I experienced and they would always say yes because they they saw that I respected them for their stories so that's the important thing to remember with Survive Man Bigfoot it's not about what Les Stroud thinks or believes it's the people I was interviewing the places where I was going it's what's going on there that's that's what mattered of the Bakwas and see for myself what's possible in any of the work that I do I always got to remember, you put the blaze on the trail for heading back. You can put them on both sides, it's good, but if you're only going to do one, do it on the sight line for coming back. Otherwise, it's on the other side of the tree and you can't see where you're going. A lot of times, too, if I cut down like this and I leave the strip... Some incidental survivor man instruction. Actually go back up. Couldn't help myself. And cover your blades. Oh, look. So you got That's a less drought axe. Knock that strip off as well. A little bit of hidden marketing there, the Discovery Channel never picked up on. Lots of tracks in the moss, probably deer. The interesting thing is, anything that's going to make a track on a muddy spot, an open spot, we call them sort of the little track zones, is something that, for the most part, doesn't care that you see its tracks. So if it doesn't want you to see its tracks, uh, it'll avoid, even like wolves, they'll avoid an area like this. Now, this area is really well worn. I'll bet you... A lot of animals come and urinate on this stump here. Wow, that's a lot of bear poop. Oh, and here's more. According to researchers, bear and Sasquatch territory is virtually identical. Which I think is probably more a result of uh, rainfall. Than anything, than anything else. There are maps that you can check out where they show average rainfall and then Bigfoot sightings and, and virtually identical uh, with a few outliers, but for the most part, it looks like the same map. Interesting. Impression. Right here, I got in the moss. I mean, everything else is covered in moss and this section is not. It's flattened down. It's uh, worn down. Really. Easily could be bears. Another thing that is very curious to me is where's the big trails, like you know, elephants and, and giraffes and 
You know, big, big creatures, even you know, bear and moose, they leave trails all the time. And you can tell, you can see the hoof prints, you can see the paw prints, you can see the scat. Something that, that you know, is reported to weigh as much as 900 pounds has got to leave more marks in the bush. If we see footprints of a bear, we say there are a bear there. If we see footprints of a cougar, we say there are a cougar there. We see footprints that are massive and humanoid. What's there? Well, that's the question, isn't it? Uh, I'm thinking Whatever very... There, leaves tracks, screams in the night, throws rocks, befriends people, abducts or even kills people. Or is it all just elaborate hoaxing? I'm seeking the truth. One other technique. That... Now that scripting still matters because it's still early in my journey. I was still seeking the truth. And I'm still torn between the worlds of physicality, such as uh, uh, an upright walking ape that s sweats and defecates and leaves tracks, and the spiritual side uh, that uh, the people of Clem II wanted to express. It's a strange journey indeed. That I was told is worth trying is to film what's going on behind you as you walk away. So that's something I'm going to do right now, is uh, switch on the little camera on my back and just film as I walk out. It's said that buckwas will follow behind you, feeling more secure that you're not watching them. Uh, that's interesting, because that's similar as a, a uh, that's what predators do. You know, big cats and uh, sharks, they, they won't attack you from the front. They like to attack you from behind. They, don't, they, they, want, they want to see the back of your head, not your eyes. If you see your eyes, they won't attack. Uh, so that's interesting. And, and by the way, the, the one, the person who told me about uh, filming in behind me, myself, as I walk away, it's two individuals actually, it was uh, David Politis and uh, Scott Carpenter, both suggested that as a really great technique for accidental, anecdotal, uh, or actual uh, footage of something following you. So filming backwards, I may just be able to fool something and get it caught on camera. Calling out a coyote-like whoop is reported to be something that gets their attention. There's an internet's worth of Bigfoot research ideas, so anything's worth a try. Nothing. Interesting thing about hoaxers and trying to lay out hoaxes is that those who are getting involved are really getting pretty good at it. In some cases, you look up and there's tracks going straight up a hill. Six foot stretch, stride. Now how is that possible by a human? Well, it's not. Unless you wear the tracks on backwards and go down the hill. Where there's a will to hoax, there's a way. There's different stages of accepting the fact of the existence of a species. Stage one, is you start to hear about the species by local people. Stories, reports, different incidents. Stage two, someone comes up with a skeleton. Stage three, a body or body parts are found. Stage four, a live specimen. And that results in stage five, which is on the ground research of the species. Sasquatch are firmly planted still in stage one, which basically means they remain in the cryptozoology genre. And that information was taken directly from governmental website information. To the cryptozoologist, it's a noble pursuit, ripe with the possibility of discovering something amazing and being the one to present it to the world. But the questions, Continue. The biggest issues is why do we not find bones? Where are the bones? Most biologists don't worry about that question because they know the answer. It is so exceedingly rare to find predator bones. Cougar will go and hide when it wants to die. Trying to find their bones is very much needled in the haystack. Now imagine if it was an intelligent being who wanted to hide bones. There's hundreds of thousands of bear in the wilderness. I've never found a bear skeleton. 
At least on the question of missing bones, the skeptical biologists and Sasquatch advocates agree it's a non-issue. So that's, yeah, that's important. <clears throat> because again, try to find predator bones. Go out and see if you can spot some cougar skeletons somewhere in the wilderness, or even wolf skeletons or black bear skeletons. I mean, I suppose in the end, sometimes it does happen. However, there's also, again, everything I, I would say there is this or there is that is essentially based on anecdotal references, but there are anecdotes of people that have found uh, bones and more, uh, only to um, have their stories uh, stifled, shall we say, by government representatives. That's a whole other thing to get into, which I'm not going to get into right now. Not, not for this episode. Another, that, maybe another one coming up. Uh, but certainly just, you know, accidentally coming upon a Sasquatch skeleton in the wild. It's, it's not a question, even for biologists who think it's all bubkus and don't believe in it at all, they're still going to say, yeah, but you, don't, you just don't stumble upon predator's bones. All right, enough of that. That one's put to bed, shall we say. A couple of hours boat ride from Clem 2, I've been dropped off at a cabin within 100 yards of a prolific clammy bed. This cabin is reported to have had activity, reports of Sasquatch showing up here. It was probably about six or seven of us out in the, uh, camping on this one island. And then uh, my brother and I, uh, we, we started a big fire and we started throwing more and more branches on the fire. And I can see the, you can see the eyes, the reflection of the fire off its eyes. As soon as everyone looked over, all six or seven people looked over, that Sasquatch stood up and started walking in the bush. It freaked everyone out. I mean, what do you do with a story like that? You call him a liar. Uh, and that's, I suppose, you know, that's, that's the thing about anecdotal references like this. I, 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 I'll probably repeat this every time I do a director's commentary on Bigfoot. When someone tells you a story, uh, you, you really only have four options. I'll make this quick. You only have four options on your response, uh, or at least what you think about the story they just told you. Now these, he's saying that the, they watched this thing stand up and walk away. And there was half a dozen people all saw the same thing, all agree. <clears throat> all right, uh, let's say it's your uncle or you know your brother or something like that. Well, then you only have this... Uh, I'm, I'm boring my dog. She's leaving. Yeah, she doesn't care about Sasquatch. Uh, you only have these four options, and they are uh, mistaken identity. So it was a bear. All right, but you can rule that out a lot of times, especially if it's like, say, a conservation officer or somebody like that. Uh, the person uh, is delusional. The delusional argument, you, you have to kind of set that aside because if it goes, ah, oh, you're, you're delusional. Well, there's no answer to that. If, if you think someone's delusional, you, they don't stand a chance of having you believe them in what they're trying to tell you. So we have to take the delusional argument and put it on the shelf because it just shuts the door immediately. Uh, oh, and assuming that they're not high or, or drunk, uh, then uh, you're left with uh, they're lying, and that's a big one. So I, I've heard people heard people say, "Oh no, you know, uh, yeah, my aunt told me about this or that," and uh, but I I don't know. I'm like, "Oh, well, then is your aunt a liar?" Well, hey, no, it's my aunt. She's not a liar. Well, you just said she told you she saw one, and now you're saying you don't know. Well, yeah, but well, then call her up and tell her she's a liar, because either she's lying or she isn't. You can't just throw that out there that you're not sure if you believe that person saw what they saw when. You've already confirmed it wasn't mistaken identity and they weren't high uh, and they're not delusional. Then the only other option is they're lying or they're telling you a factual representation of what they saw. Now that's the short form of my spiel on that, but that's what you've you got to do with a story like that. You hear that story, you get the other six people in the room, either call them all delusional, say they were all high, uh, or one way or another call them liars or accept that what they just told you was the truth. And if that's the case... So Sasquatch, if they exist, are said to harvest clams, uh, 
well, actually, in, in different places, different cultures have different names for them, such as uh, diggers of the sand and clam diggers. So if that isn't self-explanatory, I don't know what is. So the theory here is that being in the neighborhood of rich clam gardens and uh, harvesting them as a human being is essentially treading on their territory. So a lot of the stories in this area reflect that in terms of war uh, warnings with screams, rock throwings, stick throwings, uh, wood knocks on trees really loud, uh, enough that it scares a lot of human clam diggers away. It's really about attracting attention to myself in a way, almost create a little bit of a fuss, you know, be seen out at night with headlights flashing, digging in the clam gardens that are close to what is reported to be the territory of Sasquatch. There was an old man that was down at one of the bays down here digging clams. And um, he wasn't getting too much in where he was digging, so he's going over to the little island. And for some reason, he looked back and here there's some kind of an animal down by where he was digging. And one of the elders that was with us, he started hearing these sounds of screaming and sounds like someone was getting murdered or someone was being tortured or something. It was really weird, this loud screaming. It was a really uncomfortable feeling and just hearing that. Now, I'll interrupt right there. I mean, it was always creepy when I was doing this, by the way. Uh, two things. Number one, the reason why I didn't show the indigenous people uh, of Clem to uh, speaking was because just the sound of their voice was so powerful and the imagery that we had was always so good there that that's why I decided to use it more as a, as a narration rather than isolated interviews with them. Just didn't seem to be necessary. However, if you're watching this and you're on my YouTube channel, then if you look at, well, you're already in the Bigfoot playlist and you will see um, their interviews in full, unedited. Um, uh, also within the playlist. So after you watch this, go check out one of those. Uh, the second part I want to talk about was um, was what? What did I want to say? So that and then... Oh, right. That guy was talking about... Um, I've heard this a lot about the screaming, like, like people being tortured or something. The first ever experience that I had of something that's just was a little crazy... Uh, otherworldly was uh, near the Moon River in Ontario, Canada, out on a survival mission with my buddy Doug Getgood. He's in a shelter on the other side of a berm. I'm down by the lake in a shelter and I heard screams like I've never heard anything like that before. It sounded like about, I don't know, half a dozen women being tortured in a satanic ritual or something. It, it just freaked me right out. Uh, and I actually went back to, to Doug and I said, did you hear that? And he was sound asleep. He didn't hear a thing. I said, well, I, it was the only time in my life I said, I'm leaving, I'm not staying here. And I got out of the bush that night with it. I said, let's go. And uh, I forgot all about it. Never even thought what it might be until many years later when I kept hearing it again and again and again about the screaming. Now, I will say that two things in the wilderness do make crazy, horrifying sounds when they scream. One, uh, cougar. Cougar makes some terrible sounds. Um, and then the other one is porcupines. Porcupines battling or potentially mating. Also terrifying sounds. So there is some, you know, cross-reference there to uh, possibilities of it being easily explained by animals we're quite familiar with. Our tails were almost full and our socks were almost full and um, just boom, out of nowhere, this big rock right in the middle of us where we're thinking it just missed we didn't wait we, we took off like scared rabbits <laughs> yeah the rock throwing thing man so many stories of rocks being thrown clams outside the cabin where many encounters have happened let's Actually, remember a cabin that's had activity where they uh bears can't throw rocks they, they've hit the walls before so see what happens while i'm here Making a little bit of a ruckus around this place. Like I don't, I'm not trying to like be creepy or creepy out, but you gotta imagine, you know, looking out that window and seeing a, a, a Sasquatch face looking in at you or seeing a hand go up against it. That's gotta make you jump right out of your skin. All right, let's see how the night goes. From what I've found, the methods for provoking an encounter with a Sasquatch are as variable 
as the reported encounters themselves. So my thought is to follow the lead of my hosts, the people, native elders, scientists, wildlife biologists, wilderness trekkers, hunters, mushroom pickers, anyone at all who claims an encounter. And in this case, there's no hardcore survival needed, just a night in a cabin. That was key to me. If you have a certain way in your area that you say it would suggest cr results in potential encounters with something, anything, uh, then I was not going to argue with that. I was like, okay, what do you do? Oh, cameras and trees, a couple of cameras and trees. Oh, you hoop and you, you and holler and you hit trees with pieces of wood? Okay, I'll do that. So this was early on in, in producing the series, and, and so I was just very much wide open to whatever it took. Simple as that. No judgment. My night was uneventful. Although after a great feast of clams, I got a good sleep. Nothing hit the cabin walls. No screams in the night, and no footprints left outside. So I'm being boated out to Clem 2 Hill, an old volcano the local native population was successful in protecting from the miner's shovel. But before I can even get out of the boat, I'm greeted with a perplexing sight. Boated around out of the other side of the volcano, and there's an old, old logging road. I want to try and see if I can make my way up. It's supposed to be quite the, quite the hot spot for Sasquatch activity. And we come along here, that's the weirdest sight is uh, see this skeleton here. And it gets better than this. Let me show you the, the bones first, though. And literally, we're just, you know, just, just laying like this. I mean, look, if you step your back a bit, like a sort of in this, when you're way over there, you're looking ahead going, what the heck is that? And it's this perfect line of bones. Now, we're all guessing that it's probably sea lion. It's really bizarre to me that the bones aren't ripped apart. I mean, normally if an animal's caught and eaten by anything, the bones are, are ripped apart. And here we have a perfect skeleton. And it's been here long enough that grass is growing through it, and all in one perfect piece. Then you step up just a couple of steps, and you see this. I mean, this is like, like a nest, really. It's all, I mean, everything is circular. So something's been turning around to lie down. I mean, highly likely a bear. That would be my guess. Big one, though. That's for sure. I mean, often moose, deer, bear, a lot of large animals will curl up in the grass like this and lie down. But whatever lied down here was massive. If it was a bear, it was a very big bear. You can feel the indentations in the sand. Can I place it? No. I can't place it. Maybe bear. This is really strange. Let's give you another, another view of it. I can't call this a hoax. No human has been out here for quite possibly years. No one knew I was coming out here today. As if it were some kind of ritualistic scene, this spine of bones laid out as they are is one of the creepiest things I've ever experienced in the wilderness. Who or what would leave such a sight and why? That's true. That was just so creepy. I was like, got it. Like the boatman, he'd never seen anything like it in his life. I mean, if that was a wild animal, you know, capturing and killing predation, those bones should be just ripped apart. Just be a mess all over the place. Most of them, half of them in the water, probably. But just laid there like that, it's the strangest thing I've ever seen. I mean, to this day, I can't explain it. If you can, if you're a, a marine biologist and you've got an answer for it, then please post below because I'm still perplexed by it. There's nothing about it that makes any sense. I'm a few hours boat ride from Clem 2, Canada, pushing deeper into what is considered to be Bakwas territory, Sasquatch, Bigfoot. This is Clem 2 Hill, a place with a long history of encounters. And for now, my mission is simply hiking the area, looking for signs that stand out from the norm, at least the wilderness norm, okay, so look at this here. as I know it. Now, likely case scenario, rot. And down it goes. And if you're a little too obsessive about it, you're going to say that's a Bigfoot bend. 
I think it's probably just rot. A lot of times, though, there are markings that they they talk about in the trees here when, you, when you've got to step up over something and come past, like an area like this. And you, you go here, if you look there, you'll see a worn area where something has stepped up. And it could be six, seven feet up, way higher than any bear would make. A lot of the branches sometimes, if you look up about eight or nine feet tall, the spruce trees, when they die, the branches become very jagged, very sharp, and you can see a lot of uh, clumps of hair caught on them. So for DNA evidence, that's worth looking for. I'm basically about, well, not even halfway up the volcano, nowhere near that. The, f the forest here is so thick, it's really closed in. It's never going to be as easy as going to a campsite where somebody said they saw an eight-foot hairy creature and it's going to you know, show up for you, uh, if such a creature even exists. If it does exist, then its ability at, at being stealthy will be supreme in a place like this. I'm not going to be able to outsmart it or outtrack it. I'd have to wait till it comes to me. And I think that's really the name of the game for the while is getting myself in deep into areas that people have these incredible claims and see if uh, something comes to me. And it's going to take a lot of effort, trying different methods for this. Yeah, see, that's, that's the key. And that's one of the biggest lessons I learned with Survivor Man was uh, can't fall. from my Bigfoot is that you, you have to study it and research it for so long in so many ways. And in the end, the people of it's going to come down to one fluky, lucky situation, not to anything that you can do in the wilderness. Not if this, this phenomenon is, is for real, because it'll just be hyper-intelligent if it is. encounter that was told by a couple of people in the community that was actually driving up the hatchery road. The way he told it to me was that as he drove up and he suddenly stopped, the guy was looking up and he seen there was something standing on the road. The big thing was so hairy. He just walked like us, those young people. And his girlfriend beside him was so terrified that she was actually hiding. He said that he put the car into gear, looked back up and the animal was gone. This is a vast wilderness, thousands and thousands of square miles of area for something to exist. My quest is to seek some kind of contact. Now, if you just look at that imagery there, this is key because in the distance beyond the mist and the fog, you can kind of see there's a depression there. That's the lake where I was going to go. Well, I did go. That's where I'm going. And it's really, it's literally the lake in the mist. Uh, where there's a, a trail that leads from the hatchery and you go up to it. It's stunningly beautiful, but ultimately creepy. With whatever it is that's out here, whatever screaming, throwing rocks, being spotted, making tracks, I'm not going to say I believe or I disbelieve. I don't either. I simply have had a few strange experiences. I want to find out for myself what's out here. What I do is survival. I guess that's what I'm good at. Whatever else is out here will have that skill set in spades over me. You know, the way to look at this is you're watching me paddle out here to this spot, and you are completely convinced in your mind that the whole notion of Sasquatch is just silly. They just don't exist. It's not possible. OK. Well, if that's the case, then what's the big deal for me tonight? There should be nothing to worry about, right? Maybe a wolf pack. Be careful about that. Maybe a bear. I'll be careful about that. But I've been in lots of wolf territory, bear territory before. That should be all I have to worry about. If the other side is right, well, that's a whole new ball game. There's no wind tonight. I guess that's a good thing. I'll hear anything. There's something to be heard. For example, were a tree to fall, I'll hear it. And that was a fortuitous comment to make. Certainly not planned. As for me, I'm going to remain calm and just tell myself that I'm spending the night and the next night alone on an incredibly beautiful lake. 
outside of Clem 2 BC. I mean, this is picture perfect. And it's a place where, generally speaking, I'm very comfortable. Let's see if that comfort stays for the night. And so I find myself at the far end of Clem 2 Lake. Teenagers and young men will come out here on occasion to hike or hunt. But most residents of Clem 2 have no interest in going up to the place of horrifying night screams, rock throwings, and sightings of the big hairy people. Some are terrified of this place. And one pilot has claimed to have seen an entire Sasquatch family walking along this very beach. The locals call this place the Bakwas home. Man, there's a lot of big wolf tracks here. Okay, here's something I'm gonna do. I got a little tiny buried camera here. I'm gonna put an apple right in front of it. I'll take another apple and put it on the log here. Good thing about this is I'll hear. The whole thing with the apple thing is, uh, hmm. It, it comes out of the concept of gifting and that, that certain people have said they've, they've been able to create a kind of a relationship with uh, local Sasquatch by gifting them. And um, trinkets, marbles, but also you know, natural things like apples, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, you know what, it, it, for me it just fell under the, the, um, the blanket of, of doing everything I could do that other people have said they do. Something walking in the creek or the swamp, I'm kind of bordered all, all, on all sides. Of course, they could, something could step right over top of it as well. But at least I might hear something sloshing around. My hosts looked after me at the cabin in the hill. But out here, I'm finally alone. It's how I do my best work. This is an attempt at getting them curious. Three wood knocks. I'll start with the action of wood knocking. Supposedly a great way to get a response from Sasquatch. I'll do that again at dusk and maybe around one in the morning because likely I will want to stay up for most of the night. I don't think I'm gonna sleep. Um, it is kind of creepy doing that actually when you, when you, you're basically trying to communicate and uh, I don't know what I would have done if I got an answer back right there. By the way, this uh, logo here, the Survivor My Bigfoot logo, uh, created by my wonderful editing team uh, is from this very episode, this very lake. And uh, you'll see this logo. I use it in the front and, and the back of uh, a number of films that I do. And the way it happened was uh, Ian Oje, who was getting all the aerial footage, was getting aerial footage of this lake. And uh, the uh, I guess it malfunctioned. And the drone fell in the water. They went over to get it. When they got to the drone, it was still running in the water, six feet down. They managed to fish it out. Of course, it was, it was toast after that, but the card was in it and the card was still good. And so uh, to this day, uh, we just reversed the, uh, the shot. So it's actually coming out of the water uh, to the logo Survive Man Bigfoot or sometimes Les Trout Production. Anyway, that all happened right here in, uh, on this little lake, Clem 2 Lake here. Um, I'm trying to get a Sasquatch encounter to happen to me. There it is, right I there. Can't. Look how beautiful that is. This lake was just gorgeous. Up at the far end of Clem 2 Lake, a pristine place of wonder, where lies a mystery that gives the town's inhabitants less than a mile away nightmares. All right, something else that I've uncovered in the research is a tactic by which when I have to relieve myself, I go over and always pee in the same spot. And that uh, this can actually lead to something coming and always peeing <coughs> adjacent to that spot. So whenever I have to relieve myself while I'm here, I will uh, do exactly that. I think I'll always come over to, there's a bushes over here and I'll get on the other side so that <coughs> maybe whatever might do this practice will 
a little slight behind the scenes story here. You can tell I'm limping, actually. Uh, this was back when I was having a lot of lower, lower back pain. And so I'm actually limping along the beach there. Better now. Thanks to yoga. Do it over here. Yeah, sun's definitely going down. You can see it's going down fast. And that's what I'm going to do now. I'll leave myself on this side of the bush. All right, well, before it gets too dark, let's take a look at what I have for uh, just protection while out here. Standard bear spray on my belt. I've got two kinds of, we we'll call them bear bangers. They're really, they're flares. More than anything, it's really just in case I've got an overly eager pack of wolves or a rogue black bear bothering me, but chances of that are highly unlikely. I'm not one who thinks that uh, wolves are out here to attack us. Now, normally right about now is when I might play my harmonica, get a nice echo going. But I think in this situation, I'm going to stick with the wood knocks. Uh, if I'm trying to attract something, then uh, let's play by the rules that certain researchers have laid out. And one of them is, that it's the wood knocking that really attracts them. Uh, I've been told that uh, hands down wood knocking gets you results. You get knocks back or interaction that night. Notice the language I'm using. It's a lot of I've been told this or they say that. That's because this was still early in my journey of, of researching this phenomenon. And so I was testing a lot of um, uh, bits of advice that I've been given over the years. Uh, over the time and the, the different places I was visiting, I would always get new bits of advice. So I'm constantly testing it. Uh, a year from this moment, and, and I'm in a different headspace entirely with a lot of experience, but at this point, I'm still testing the waters, so to speak. So I've already knocked three times, and I will do it again later on in the night. And I won't play harmonica, I'll keep that inside the tent. Uh, if I get some action, some activity, then I'll play the harmonica inside the tent and basically make myself out to be a very confusing animal so that whatever is out there might take interest in me just out of pure curiosity. It was so still there that night. I almost, almost completely forgot that I also have audio recorders. Just freaked myself out there. Uh, I have audio recorders. I was on edge. So I'm gonna put four of them out, capture any sounds through the night. My gracious hosts from Clem 2 would prefer I approach this all spiritually. And I am respecting that. But I can't help but throw in a little technology as I dig deeper into this phenomenon. And uh, it shoots awfully long way with night vision, enabling me to pick up great distances in the dark. That's helpful in a situation like this. All right. Let's just see how the rest of the night goes. It's going to be spooky if I get an answer back now. Oh, the anticipation. Nothing. Yet. After an uneventful night, I paddled the lake for two hours in the morning, only to return to a perplexing surprise. The two apples on the beach are gone. Now, they were on the ground, like the case scenario is, something very simple came along and took it. So I'm gonna step wherever it's clear sand. All right, so what have I got here? This is new here. I'm just circling around the tracks that are really 
Interesting. I don't believe they're wolf tracks from old, yet they look fresh. It's very hard to tell. Power of suggestion is a very powerful thing indeed. But as I look at this print here, we've actually got the indentations of one, two, three, four, five toes. And this toe over here, bigger, fatter than the rest of them, cross in a straight line. Before I get the chance to think it's just a random scuff in the sand, I find an identical track 40 yards away. One, two, three, four, five. Let's cast them both. All right, I got my pancake mix. Just need some blueberries. This is actually a mixture of a casting material called hydrocal. If any consideration at all is going to be So cooked. this was actually a lot of fun. I, I gotta say one thing, casting tracks you find in the wild, it's a lot of fun. Um, especially when you see the final result and you're looking at this reverse impression of, of the track. And this was really intriguing to do because a possibility for me here was that if, if these were actual tracks of a Sasquatch, they would be the smallest in existence. Uh, potentially of a of a baby or a child. Um, just let that sit and be what it is. I don't know, but well, let's see what I'm doing here. Three of them found caves out here with such a strong stench emanating that they stopped their search in that area out of fear and left the caves, vowing to never return. I want to a search and rescue mission where um, they came upon a cave and the, and the stench was so bad they just they didn't even look. They turned around and, and left. Um, so uh, that was up in this area and I'm trying, I'm walking through that area trying to find the cave. Find those caves. There used to be a trail along here that the uh, townspeople from Clem 2 would use to get to the beach where I've been staying. But over the years, people got so freaked out by the strangeness out here, the rock throwing, the screams, breaking trees, that uh, they stopped using the trail and it's probably mostly largely grown over. Now, this forest has a look to it that will be considered to be normal. What I'm looking for is what doesn't look normal. Figuring out what doesn't look normal in amongst what does is the art of tracking. It's likely torn apart by bears looking for uh, grubs and insects to eat a long time ago. There's tracks here. Looks a lot like uh, bear track. Lots of little caves, but nothing substantial. One thing I will say, if there was some kind of ancient hominid species still hiding and existing out here, it makes perfect sense to live in caves. Oh. You know, watch where you fall. If you reach out and grab a devil's club plant, it's gonna hurt. few deep holes to fall down in here. That's for sure. One wrong step. And you're in the middle of a horrible survival situation. <sighs> Who wants to be in one of those? I think that was one of my advantages I had in, in researching the phenomenon is that uh, a lot of other situations surrounding doing that kind of research um, that put you right in the thick of certain kinds of wilderness was nothing that ever intimidated me. I was used to that. And so I didn't have that added on top of being in Sasquatch territory. Uh, I was, to me, I was like being at home. So I was cool with that. And that enabled me to focus on the, uh, the phenomenon instead. I do not find the caves nor any signs of large primates. So I'll take my place back at the camp to sit out the night at the edge of Clem Two Lake. I've replaced the missing apples with another apple and a sandwich out on the sand, essentially as bait or an offering, however you want to look at it. All right, I've lit the fire, but uh, the rain's coming down now. It's windy and it's raining. It's gonna be a completely different night tonight. Cameras are rolling, audio recorders are rolling. I don't know what else to do, except sit and wait this out and see what happens. Sure was nice having a tent. Well, it's been pouring rain all night long, just bucketing down. Well, I can see the sandwich and the apple are still there, so nothing, nothing over there. 
just a little while ago, there was a Bigfoot researcher who came and stayed, I guess, a few hundred yards from the trailhead at the other end of the lake. He didn't want to come all the way to the end of the lake here. And he also came in here with four big dogs, stayed here for quite a while, and had no, no Bigfoot activity. And the day after he left, there was a family camping down the creek a bit. They all of a sudden heard all of this smashing and some in the bush, like branches breaking, and then or something uh, being hit, like with a club, you know, trees being hit with a club sort of thing. The father of the family doesn't get spooked very well. He's a bushman. He uh, immediately told people in the town, and quite a few people from the town all went up to this campsite and all heard the sounds. They all heard all of the smashing and crashing, and they felt that what he'd done is he bothered the family of Sasquatch that live in this area, at least that they feel live here, and made them upset, got them angry. That was three days ago. Maybe my food gifts will appease whatever or whoever the researcher got upset. But it's an interesting question. Are modern day Bigfoot researchers poking at a hornet's nest without realizing it? Should there be a protocol of respect displayed when attempting contact with this phenomenon? Yeah, see, that's it. I was, again, I was trying to piece together all of the, the ways to really approach this phenomenon. And uh, in that situation, uh, they didn't actually feel that that guy was very, very respectful. Yeah, I think it was from Germany. And he had four massive dogs. I think they, were, he said, they said they were like big, like Rottweiler types. And um, it's like it's the kind of thing you have to approach, you know, approach skeptically, if you like, but with a level of respect at the same time. And uh, when they were telling me all this story, I thought they were going to say it was something that had happened six months previous. No, it was three days before I got there that there was cracking and smashing and screaming going on all around this lake while the whole town stopped and could hear it. No action last night due to the heavy rain. Apparently Sasquatch has weather it likes or dislikes. But then it happened again. Before my morning paddle, the apple and the sandwich were there. Two hours later, they were gone. So just like yesterday, something has messed with the apples and the sandwich on the log. The half apple's on the ground and the sandwich is gone. Who knows? Ravens came back, Ravens took the sandwich. Probably as simple as that. Here's the rub. These are motion-triggered cameras, so sensitive that even a blowing piece of grass triggers the camera to record. You see the bird, but what it didn't record was the sandwich disappearing. It's as if it malfunctioned only for that moment. And as a filmmaker, I have no answer for that. That will be a recurring theme for me uh, when I went to Radium Springs and filmed there. My hair trigger cameras, trail cams, capturing footage before and after something goes missing on the camera, but not capturing the sandwich, the apple, as it's being taken away. There's no technical answer for that. I mean, a moth goes by and the camera triggers and films it. Something lifting up a full sandwich or an apple in the viewfinder of the camera, like me holding up this remote right now, is going to trigger the camera and you're going to see some remnants of that happening. Yet here, and then it would happen again later to me, in Radium Springs uh, and other spots, uh, nothing gets caught on camera. But everything before and after is on, on the camera. Don't have an, ex uh, an answer for that. I'm gonna approach that again when I get to the Radium Springs episode, which, which is the other one I did with uh, Mr. Todd Standing. Uh, and I'll tell you what he had to say about it, of which I completely disagreed and corrected him and what I have to say about it. But we'll call that a teaser for the next one. But Sasquatch advocates claim that as a general consistency, electronics go awry whenever Sasquatch is involved. But that's an interesting one, right? Because it sounds like a cop-out for all of us researching the phenomenon. Oh, right, your camera malfunctioned just then. All right. And yet, you'll talk to these people with honesty in their hearts and you'll find that their cameras malfunction. I, and I, I had it happen to me, happened to me and Max Atwood on the uh, ones that the, the show we shot in Willow Creek in California. Cameras never malfunctioned. And that night it malfunctioned at a critical moment. The 
again, and I'm not even asking you to use your mind's eye. I've just got to get the sand off somehow. The track itself is here like this. One, two, three, four, five toes. All the piggies that went to market are right there. This one is more pronounced. I'll show these to John Bindernagel, who's an expert on cast. He's got quite a collection. Let's see what he thinks. Casting is fun. After two nights and a modest amount of strange occurrences, I'm paddling and hiking back to the town of Clem II on the northwest coast of Canada to meet up with wildlife biologist John Bindernagel and show him my new strange tracks I've casted while on the lake. He has his own tracks, and he's extremely familiar with reported prints of Sasquatch. So I want to get his opinion of mine. Heel. You're there. Yeah. Heel, and then, yeah. okay, toe, gee, good spotting. Huge wide heel. We have this hypothesis that, that this thing looks like an upright grade ape. This, of course, is yeah. very ape-like. Yes. Chimpanzee, the gorilla. John is convinced that these are casts worthy of showing to some experts in the field. And so I'll hold on to them. Hold that thought. All right. Now, <clears throat> did you hold that thought? Well, guess what? I forgot that I actually have those tracks still. And uh, here they are. This is the, uh, this is the, the first track. It's very faint, very hard to, uh, to see what's there. But the second track, was a little bit better. And uh, there's the toe prints, you can see. Very small though, as you can see, by what being held in my hand. And then when I went down and met with um, John Bindernagel and Jeff Meldrum together, uh, Jeff actually gave me this track, which uh, I believe is, if I'm, I'd have to call him and check on, but it's a famous, Cassid track uh, from um, mm, darn it I forgot I'll have to call him and ask him but anyway reported to re be a real track look at the size of that and then a very good friend of mine in Ontario did a casting of another track and gave that one there so pretty uh, pretty intriguing stuff Let's get back to the show. But for now, I want to get back up to the lake. I need more than tracks. I need something real to experience. Oh, it gets real tonight, all right. People that have gone up to the lake have heard things, you know, growling or something moving really fast in the bushes, screaming and hollering. You know. One of the guys even got so scared that he took off in the middle of the night and just left us there. He told me that um, it's a bug, or she said in her language, that's uh, you know, like a Sasquatch. Ah, the genius of my editor, Barry Farrell. Okay. Oh, this is it. But instead of uh, avoiding that shot where the camera falls over, he uses it as a transition. But here we go. This is when it happened. Look how still that lake is. It's like glass. There was not a breath of air. A tree just fell over. Over there. A very large tree. You don't think I'm nervous? Check out how I'm breathing through my mouth because it, it freaked me out. And it didn't really sound like it fell over. It sounded more like it was thrown into the water. Very big too, not like a branch. Wow, I've got chills and the hair's up on the back of my neck. I hope that was just natural, I'm shaking. But I'm, I was just sad, I haven't lit a fire yet or anything. There's just. Boom, boom, crash. I 
Maybe I'll turn on the audio recorders, which means, unfortunately, I have to walk towards that area. OK, I'm spooked now. I am here on the stillest of nights. There is not a breath of wind. You know, now look at all those. Oh, my pops have come to join the party here. All those trees up in behind there that you can see. I mean, it was right about where my body is. is if you look just beyond my body, to, that's where the tree down. There was water in between that spot there and the forest. Hey, guys, I'm busy doing a director's commentary. No fighting. I know. Like, good girl. Uh, where was I? I rudely interrupted by the chocolate labs. Uh, yeah, it's just in beyond my head there. And again, it was more like um, a big tree was like, <laughs> and splash. And when I got there, there was nothing like freshly in the water, leaning like it fell. Whatever was there, it looked like it had been thrown. And any other time, in any other camping trip, in any other situation, I'd say, oh, that's really cool. Tree must have just rotted just at that time. Oh, and I got to hear it. That's what I've been telling myself for years and years. But since doing the research, there's a lot about how they push trees over to scare you. Whatever they are. Uh, qualifier, I'm still, you know, being like, hey, whatever they are. And that's, that, that wasn't a joke. I mean, it was important for me to be like that. I'm still like that, to be honest with you. I will uh, say uh, one, one idea that was put forward is that, you know, I wonder, and I, and I always thought, found it really intriguing. I was like, what if, what if they push a tree down? Again, they, right, push a tree down, and they do it just to see what, how you'll react. Kind of like push, and then like, and watch. And, I, and as silly as that sounds, I thought, yeah, that's actually got some validity to it. Like that, if, if they were curious, that it would be something they might do just to get your reaction kind of thing. I'm out here in what's reported to be, I don't know, whatever you want to call it, a hot spot for Bigfoot, I guess. And uh, it's the most stunningly beautiful, quiet night here right now at a huge rock or tree I'm all spooked now. Falls over in the corner there. Doesn't make sense. If I get something back, I don't know that I'll even stay. I'm so freaked out right now at this point. Uh, that I'm nervous and breathing through my mouth because I'd never had this experience before. So, so you know, experiences were just beginning with the filming of Bigfoot in Clem 2. And uh, by the end of this year, there was just too many to, to take me all evening to sit and share them with you. Uh, and I'm still nervous when certain things happen, but here I'm just like kind of beside myself. Try not to listen. You see, this is the thing, too. It's one of those things, right? It's like, OK, why didn't I get that recorded? Literally, I'm sitting here thinking, well, it's almost dark. Should get the fire going. And because I've got, you know, I've got eight hours on the recorder, so I want them to work through the night. So it's like, well, I'm here, I'll wait. You know, I'm not expecting anything right now, so I'll wait a while. And then I will uh, turn on the recorders. So nothing's on yet. I wasn't talking to you, so I didn't have the camera running. I was sitting here quietly, enjoying this. This is going to be a long night. I sat up a long time this night, let me tell you. Oh, 
all the times I've heard a single solitary tree come over near to where I was camping on a still, still night. I've always written it off, too. It just happened to be when the tree rotted. And I just happened to be there to hear it fall. I'm going to start paying attention to that more often now. True stories. That at that moment, on a completely still night with no rain or wind, the tree fell due to rot. But I mean, that's an interesting thing. Uh, you know, the whole uh, tree being pushed over, tree falling. Uh, certainly, a whole new play on if a tree falls in a forest and no one's there to hear it, doesn't make a sound. Uh, the thing is, um, I have paid attention ever since then. And it's really incredible how often it happens in situations and circumstances that seem odd, like, well, what's odd? Well, just, you know, just uh, alone in the wilderness, still night, no wind, uh, in, in, and in areas that are reputed to be, you know, active for anecdotal references of, of Sasquatch, encounters of one sort or another. And it happens a lot uh, with me and uh, has happened in a number of situations, including up at my cottage in Tomogamy. Story for another time uh, that I will tell. Uh, but this was the beginning of me starting to compile a very a dossier, dossier, if you will, of anecdotal occurrences, references, uh, coincidences, um, but things that corroborate a lot. But it was the beginning. And I went on to do so many more films in this genre. And again, my, my point was that I was researching a phenomenon. And if you can just keep it to that. If you've watched this and you were like, oh, I can't believe he's doing one on Bigfoot again. But you ended up getting, making it this far to the end. Just know that it's just me doing, uh, again, just research into a phenomenon. And when you have thousands, not dozens, not hundreds, but thousands of anecdotal references all corroborating. When you have hundreds of indigenous cultural stories all corroborating. There's got to be something to it. Whatever it is, there's got to be something to it. And that was what I was seeking out in making Survivor Man Bigfoot. Okay. I uh, hope you enjoyed this. And... Uh, I'm going to go let my dogs out because clearly they've come up and they need to go outside. Oh, but before I go, one last look for you. Check that out. I mean, look at the size of it. Yeah, that's something. Oh, second last thing. Oh, my poor editor Luke's going to have to put this all together, but if you haven't picked it up yet, there's not that many left. The Les Stroud 20th Anniversary Film Collection, complete with all of Survivor Man Bigfoot. All right. Now I'm really done. Let's let the foot take you out.